What's going on? My name is Will, and I have the honor and the privilege as serving as one of the leaders here at Transformation Church. I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you are watching from. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe that God has such an incredible word for you today. So let's jump into this amazing message. We are on week seven of our series, Worship on the Word. See, y'all are some real ones for that. I didn't know if you were going to go with me, but you did, and I'm grateful. Um, but in this series, we've been talking about worship, what worship is, and uh, we've been using this kind of working theme that worship is our love expressed to God as a response of his grace towards us. It is not an obligation. It's not something we're forced to do, but it's a response. It's saying, God, you've already given me so much. You've already done so much, so I'm responding to that grace. And so I'm super excited to be closing out the series today, and then we'll go into fun month. Um, but I want to give you something that will kind of be our foundation, our anchor as we go today, and then we're going to keep on moving. I'm going to read this to you, um, and then we're going to read a scripture. I want you to write this down. This will be our anchor kind of foundation that we'll build off of. Uh, write this down. When you learn to worship. There is no worry, no weight, or warfare that can hold you down. When you learn to worship, worship in good times, worship in bad times, worship when you feel like it, worship when you don't feel like it, worship when it's the right answer, worship when it's the wrong answer. When you learn to worship, there is no weight Weight, weight of, of financial pressure. There is no worry, worrying about your future or warfare. Actual, the Bible says it this way, for our battle is not against flesh and blood. Like there is some stuff that's behind the scenes. But when you learn how to worship God, Tra Pastor Travis said it last week, to be a unconditional worshiper, not a conditional worshiper, not, oh, well, you know, if things are going my way, no, no. When you learn to worship, there is no weight, no worry, no warfare that can hold you down. I want to read you a scripture, um, and I, this scripture is super special to me because it's actually the first scripture I remember memorizing. Um, I grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, I, we went to a church called Abundant Life Christian Church, and there was like 12 people in the church. I was related to 11 of them, and then it was the weird production guy, like it was the guy who knew how to run the stuff. And so uh, I remember growing up in the church, and the pastor at the time was Pastor Van Grimes, and uh, crazy how my family got into ministry was uh, Van actually got diagnosed with cancer. We had been going to the church for a while. And again, it was a small church and uh, he got diagnosed with cancer and my parents were serving there. And like we were there every time the doors were open. And I remember uh, my dad tells me the story, but he was at the hospital with Van and Van was sitting there and he looked my dad in the eyes and he said, Bubba, he used to call him Bubba. He said, Bubba, you're going to lead that church. And my dad was like, what church? What are you talking about? What do you, what do you mean? And uh, he said, you're, you're called the ministry. You've known that for a while. You've been serving. You've been leading. He had been pretty much training my dad, letting him preach. And literally there, right there on his deathbed, that's when he said, hey, I'm giving the church to you and Michelle. And that's how the Metcalf family got into ministry. We started pastoring Abundant Life Christian Church. And me and my brother Chandler were running around on the front row. Um, but the anchor scripture for the church was John 10.10. 10. And I want to read this to you. It says this, the key thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I came that they may have life, and some translation says, and abundant life. And uh, the title of my sermon today, if you're taking notes, is you're doing good. You're doing good. You're doing good. I know you haven't heard that in a while. But I just want to tell you, you are doing good. I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for comforting and encouraging the, our spirits today. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Um, I have a confession to make. Um, I am dramatic. Uh, don't act too surprised, but... I'm dramatic, specifically in my commitments. I am very dramatic in my commitments. Um, when I get involved with something, I don't do it halfway. This, I blame this on the generations behind me, but Metcalfs are all out. If we get into anything a little bit, we will have 
wiped our savings account. We will have converted 10 people to do it with us. And that's just how we are. It's great when it's following Jesus. It doesn't work when you're distracted by other things in high school. I'm not going to tell you that story. But we're very dramatic in our commitments. And I have a recent commitment that I've been doing for literally 18 days. And it is cycling. Um, I'm on my way to the Tour de France this year. I'm super excited about it. Um, thanks for that weak uh, cheer. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay. Let's see how far you can ride. Anyways, sorry. I get, when I don't feel like the joke lands, I get defensive, and so then I jab. It's just, it's a coping mechanism. Anyways. Um, but I started cycling, and this is very true. I've done, been doing it for 18 days, and I have done a lot. I've already bought, I bought a bike, sold a bike, and got a new bike. I bought the best gear you could find. It's from Australia. I found this brand, and really just the way they shot their photos were so awesome, it got me. And a massive box showed up, and Abby was like, what is this? It's like, it's all my stuff. Um, I, I just, I started riding every day. Yesterday, I rode 50 miles. Like, I'm just, I'm a, I just like, don't cheer too loud. If I pass out in the middle of the service, call the doctor. Um, but I, it's just, ha I've already, I'm trying to get my friends to, I have a friend who's already bought a bike. All, like in these 18 days, he didn't have a bike. He has a bike now. Like, it's just how I work. I commit to stuff. And so um, I was in the, here's the thing about a bike shop. Um, I grew up actually going to bike shops because I used to race BMX. And I walked into a bike shop and immediately felt all the same things again. Because a bike shop is like equally parts friendly and everybody knows you. And then also equally parts like, who are you? Like, because there's like, it's so low. So I walk into the bike shop trying to act like I know what I'm doing. I've just bought a bike off of Facebook Marketplace. Clearly, I have already Googled how a cyclist dressed and I am dressed apart because that's how I roll. So I walk in and to my downfall, they think I know what I'm doing in there. And so nobody's helping me. They're just like, what's up, man? I'm like, hey, where are the wheels? Like, I'm just, I'm so... <laughs> I am not the guy, and they're just like leaving me to my own devices. And you know when you don't know what you're doing, but you're trying to act like, and they're like, you need any help? You throw out that, just browsing, man, just browsing. When really that means like, I don't know what I'm doing in here. And so I'm looking for a gracious soul to help me. And this amazing uh, guy comes up to me. I have now uh, become friends with him. Sir, if you hear this, I love you a lot. His name is Buster. His name is actually Buster Brown. Talk about the best name ever given. Of course, he owns a bike shop. And of course, like, he's Buster Brown. And, um, and he's white, too. Like, that's what got me. I saw his name. See? She, that girl said, Buster Brown. <laughs> yes, Buster Brown is white. <laughs> Biggest revelation of the whole sermon. <laughs> Buster Brown, he comes up to me. He's like, hey, how you doing, son? Buster Brown's 58 years old. His, his legs are like they look like he's got something strapped to the back of his calf. Like, it's just like, he's just ripped. And I'm like, you know, honestly, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to get this together. And so he starts asking me questions. This other guy asked me if I was a triathlete because apparently the first bike I bought was a triathlon bike. I was like, of course I'm a triathlete. Why do you think I'm in here? Um, <laughs> I wasn't gonna look dumb in that moment. So I was like, he's like, you, are, you do triathlons? I was like, uh, yeah. I'm just working right now on my first one, of course. <laughs> but I do them a lot. So anyways, Buster. Buster comes up to me and he asks me and he says, um, you know, what, what are you doing? I was like, well, and again, here's a dramatic commitment. I am on an eight-week plan to ride a hundred, a hundred mile ride. In eight weeks, I'm gonna ride a hundred miles. You can't even get, hundred miles is from here to Oklahoma City. Tulsa's so small, you can't even go anywhere here to get miles. But I was like, that's what I'm working on. He's like, what's your, what's your average pace right now? And I was like, oh, I'm like around this part. And he said, hey, here's what you need to do. And he says, come here. And he pulls out this piece of paper. And he's like, you need to do this 105-mile, five-hour ride with us. And I was like, of course I do. <laughs> this is why I'm here, Buster. Because I'm dramatic in my commitment. And he says, what's your pace right now? He, says, he said, the only thing is we ride at a 20-mile-per-hour pace. It's real out here. He said, what's your pace? And I was like, well, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit, I was about to lie. I was about to be like, oh yeah, I'm I like probably like, uh, and I was like, well, I'm only, I'm only like 17. Like I'm, I can't, I can't roll with y'all like that. And he said this, he said, well, you're doing good. 
And right when he said you're doing, he's like, well, you're doing good. And he kind of gave me props. And in that moment, I was kind of like, that's right, Buster. I've only been doing this for two weeks. I am doing good. And then he said, and you don't know how to draft. I was like, what, 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 what you mean? Like draft beer? No, I don't drink beer. What do you mean? I, I just, my mind was like, draft what? He was like, you, you, you're doing good and you still got some stuff to learn. Well, for only being in this two weeks, you are, I wanna, you are doing good. And I, was, I left that uh, bike shop feeling two things, encouraged and expectant. I left feeling encouraged because someone who had been in for a while told me, you're doing a good job. There was a level of validation that came to me. There was a level of security that came to me. There was a level of something that just made me feel like, oh man, like I, I, I'm actually doing good. And then the other part, he said, you're doing good and, and you still have some stuff to learn. And what that told me is even though I may not be where I want to be, somebody who thinks and has been doing it, they think there's more in me. I came to talk to two groups of people, of people today, and I want to say the first thing. You are doing good. You're doing good. You're doing good with the circumstances that you grew up in. If, you would, if, you would have, if they would have been there, you, but I want to say, for how you grew up, think, think of how you grew up. You are doing good. Don't let Instagram tell you nothing different. Don't let tell the mom's club at school and how that, no. You are doing good. You're doing, you are doing good. And now here's the thing with good. Some of y'all, your goal was never good. Some of, if you grew up, how I did, dramatic and competitive, good felt like it wasn't good enough. You wanted to be great. So the fact that I'm even saying you're doing good, well, it feels like, yeah, but everybody's doing good. No, no, no. Not everybody's doing good. You are doing good. And it's funny, we get frustrated sometimes with the word good when good is the only adjective God used to describe everything you see. Good isn't good enough for you, but good was good enough for God. Y'all don't believe me. Let me read the Bible to you because I don't want to be up here saying nothing. God called the dry ground land and he gathered the waters and God saw that it was good. Verse 12, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in accordance to the kind. And God saw it and said it was and he also made the stars, ones you ain't even discovered yet. And God set them in the vault of the sky and the light of the earth to govern the day and the night. And he separated the light from the darkness and God saw that it was you are doing good. You're doing good. And, see, I actually, when they put this up, they didn't put the whole sermon title up there. It's actually, you're doing good. And, there's still some stuff for all of us to learn. Now, here's the thing. Um, the reason it's and and not but is because some of us like to use but. Like some of us say stuff like, you know, life is really hard, but God is good. And that is true, sort of. But by using the word but, you canceled out the reality of where you are. And what the church has developed a very weak ability to do is hold two realities. They don't teach you in church growing up that life can be really hard and God can be good. You can have made a mistake and God still love you. Well, you messed up and you were, you know, wilding out, but, you know, God loves you, so it's not. No, 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 no. You can be a broken, hurting, addicted person who does not know that and God can still be faithful. God can still be kind. And you can be doing good and there still be opportunity for better. And I come today with two simple things, an encouragement and an invitation. An encouragement for you to know you're doing good. And an invitation to better. Now, when we talk about good and better, um, there's a lot of things that are good, but there are some things that are just better. You know, if you talk about marriage, um, if you want a good marriage, if you want just like a good, like, this is a, this is a good marriage. Some great tips would be don't cheat on your spouse. 
Um, don't lie to them. You know, th th that is good. Better would be you could have a date night. You could learn their love languages. So you could have good and that be good and there still be opportunity for better. And today I want to encourage you in your worship that many of you, sometimes you come to church and you feel so downcast and you leave feeling so discouraged because you look to the person next to you and you think, I'm just doing good. They seem to be doing great. They're just like, they're crying and they're, yeah, their hands are so, how do they lift their hands that high? I don't even know. They're six foot eight and their hands are, they're way closer to heaven than I am. <laughs> I've thought that before as a short person. I'm like, ah, your praise is probably... And you walk in feeling like, and then you come to, sometimes you come to church or you're listening to somebody preach or somebody scrolls up on your TikTok and they start telling you all the stuff you got to do to be a better Christian. And you don't leave feeling like you're doing good. You feel like you're doing okay, but should be doing more. You came to church, but you didn't come last week. So... And this motion right here is what many of you have associated not only with the church, but therefore projected it onto your God. I saved you that one time, but if you do that again, as if God is changing in his mercies, I, 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 I healed you that one time, but you know, if you really would have taken care of yourself a little bit better, maybe you would... What? Now God has a score in heaven that he's keeping of all the good things you've done and all the bad things you've done. And now you're measuring these things and you come to church. The one place where you should leave with your head held high and feeling encouraged and you live feeling like, man, I just. Oh, I got a lot to do. And I'm not that good of a person. And I don't, and, and I and here's the, the hard thing. Is what you walked in with was genuinely the best you had. Only for you to walk in and feel like, I guess the best I had wasn't good enough. I came to encourage you. You are doing good. You're doing good. You, yes, you, watching right now, that you're watching this after you've looked at pornography, and so you're trying to cover up the fact that you feel so bad, so you Googled on YouTube sermons, and the Holy Spirit has drawn you to the sermon, even the fact that you just watched what you watched, you. You. You're doing good. And I want to invite you to better. I want to talk about um, seven good reasons to worship and seven better reasons to worship. And if you're in here today and you feel like you're on good, this is all you need to see from me. Good job. I'm proud of you that you're here. I'm proud of you that you came to church today. I'm proud of you that you showed up even when you didn't feel like it. I am... See, some of y'all, I can feel it. So, see, some, some of y'all are like, this is like water to your soul. And some of y'all, I'll be like, but you know, there, we got to be reading our Bible more. And we got to be, the, okay, 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 calm down. Here, here's, here's what I've learned. Yesterday, when my uh, crazy self decided to ride all these miles, I talked to a friend who's been cycling for a while. And he said, hey, um, you know, you need to have electrolytes when you're riding because you'll cramp up. It's not a good thing. If you cramp up, you somewhere out in Kawita. You're going to be stuck there, so <laughs> you, you don't need to do that. And so he sent me a link, and he was like, there's these organic electrolyte capsules that you can take while you're riding, and instead of having to chug a whole Gatorade, the electrolytes go straight to your muscles and keep you from cramping. So I am riding yesterday, and I'm like, oh, great. I need to take 60 of these. No, I'm joking. I didn't take <laughs> I was like, I can ride forever. Um, <laughs> I took the appropriate amount. Calm down. It's a vitamin. Uh, I took some and I'm riding and I'm, and I'm going and like an hour in, I'm like, oh man, this is kind of crazy. I'm I wonder, I guess that stuff is working. And I look down and my pace was up like seven more, like miles per hour more than it normally is. And I thought, I did not know I had this much in me. So then when I saw that, I said, let's go. So then I ramped it up, of course. 
only to then slow down uh, a few paces later. But I want to say there's some of you in here today where where you're at in the ride of life is you feel like you're doing good and your just goal today is to keep the pace you're at. There are some of you that you're going to look down in your soul today and you're going to think, I got a little more faith than I thought I had. I, th- I think there's a little more trust in God than I thought. Hold on. Let me. I, there's a, God's been better to me than I think. Let me go ahead and try something. I'm doing, you know, LeBron James started walking around doing this when he's feeling good. It's like, let me go ahead and try something. Like, so if you are on either side of this list today, I want to encourage you and I want to invite you. Seven good reasons and seven better reasons to worship God. Um, A good reason to worship God is because God is working. A good reason to worship. Is there anybody that has had God work some stuff out in your life? Like, can you just take five seconds and make some noise? If God has made a way. Come on, he did the dog bark. That was crazy. The Bible says Philippians 2.13, for God is working. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my worship where I showed up thinking, God, I just need you to work something out. Anybody showed up in church with just that, God, if you do not tell this boy to top, like you just had something in your, she started laughing. She said, that was me today. I was about to slap a grown man. No. But there are times where we worship God because, God, you are working or you have to work something out. And that's if you worship, that is good because there is something in you that happens when you start realizing, first of all, God is working. But let me even forget if if I can't see how he's working, let me go back and look at what he's already worked out. I, when I start to think back over the amount of times that I didn't know how it was going to work and somehow things that were confused, I was going to do stuff I didn't even want to, but God showed up in the nick of time and he worked something. Is there anybody who God has worked something out for you? It's good to worship God because he's working. A better reason to worship God is because he's worthy. And here's what I want to gently invite you into. If you find yourself today worshiping God on the basis of working, that is good. And that is where you need to be. And I am proud of you. If you feel like you have a little more energy in the tank, I want to gently invite you from good worship and for you to know you can worship God because he's working and because he's worthy. Because here's the beautiful thing about worthy. Even when stuff ain't working, there's something on the inside of you that knows, you know what? It's not going how I thought it would. It's not going how I wanted it to go. I'm not where I want it to be. But God, even if I don't see how you're working, you are worthy. You're worthy of my worship. You're worthy of my attention. You're worthy of my affection. God, I worship you. Because it's working and... You're worthy. The Bible says it this way. It says, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive the glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and because, you, uh, and because of your will, they existed and created. You need to know we worship a God who is working and he is worthy. And here's the beautiful thing. His worthiness is not predicated on your working. See, here's the thing they didn't tell you. Whether or not you feel like you're working and doing the right things, because some of y'all feel like, oh, I can only worship God when I'm doing all the right things and I'm acting right. And I'm, no, 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 no. You cannot be working for him. And they're really, hold up. Let me go to the person who has the answers. God, you are worthy of my praise. A good reason to worship God. It's because he's working. Because you know, God, I can come to you because you have the answers. There have been times in my own preaching where I've made people feel bad for coming to church. Be like, well, you're just coming in here to get something from God. Yeah. Why are you? Sometimes that's what it feels like. Well, yeah, that's exactly why I'm here. If that's you're doing good. 
And there's a space that I want to invite you into where you can worship a God and be standing in the middle of the fire. You can be holding your dead daughter. You, you can be standing in the middle of a situation where it looks like I don't know how this is going to work. And you can say, you know what? I'm going to step from good into a better reason. God, you're worthy of my worship because today I didn't tell my heart to beat. You woke me up this morning. God, you're worthy because God, there were times when I didn't know how, there were times I didn't know how I was going to be here. But the fact that our marriage is still here, God, you are worthy. Yeah, there's some stuff that's going on that I don't know how it's going to work out. You're doing good. And I want to invite you to better. Um, a, a good reason to worship God, number two, a good reason to worship God is because God is obvious. Anybody has some stuff in your life that felt like I, there is no way anybody else could have done that but God? <laughs> Is there, like, there have been some times, because here's the thing, some of us get so caught up in the mystery of God that you miss the obvious stuff. <laughs> Fellas, let me help you. You with her, and the fact that that happened is an obvious sign that God was on your side, brother, because you... <laughs> some of you don't play now. You was cool in high school, but we ain't there no more. And she stayed with you as you have progressed into the place you are at. That is an obvious sign that the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Jireh, your provider, is on your side. There's some stuff in our life that if we just start looking at the obvious, ooh, I still got breath in my lungs. I didn't, I didn't, some people didn't have breath in their lungs when they tried to get up this morning. And I don't mean to bring that down. I'm just, like, there's some obvious stuff that's like, ooh, my legs are still working. Hold on, let me, let me, oh, Jesus, I woke up, my legs is working. That's a, there's some miracles in your life. Being told you won't ever have children and then you have three babies? There ain't nobody else that could do that but God. There's some stuff that when you start looking at, it's so funny because I, I, I see people on social media and the internet and they start debating stuff and where stuff come from and how the world all started and well, all these things. And I just sometimes I'll be like, all right, dog, come on. Come on, though. You think there was, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying if you believe this, this is bad. I'm just, for me personally, I just be feeling like it take more faith to believe like there was nothing. And now all of a sudden nothing shook around and was like, blah, 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 blah. and everything you see is I just feel like it feel more obvious to me that there was a big guy who was more grand than everything. And he said, you know what, I'm going to step down into time and I'm going to knit this thing together. So beautiful. you don't ever look at a painting and be like, man, I think I don't know how that happened. That's crazy. How'd that LED wall get? Man, it wasn't an LED wall, and we walked in here, and then the LED wall was there. That's how it happened. Maybe. But a more obvious thing, in my opinion, would be if there's something created behind that, there's probably a creator. There's just some stuff that when I think about my worship, I worship on the fact, God, there's just some stuff you've done that's obvious. Good reason to worship is because God is obvious. A better reason to worship is because God is omniscient. So if you're in here today and your worship is on the foundation of the obvious stuff God is doing, you're doing good. And I want to invite you into a place to find and build your life on his omniscience. The fact that he knows everything. When you start thinking about the fact God, there's some obvious stuff that I can worship you for because it's obvious that you've kept my marriage. It's obvious. But then there's some stuff I don't know about. There's some stuff that's not as obvious. God, you sent me all these prophetic words, but it's not obvious to me how that's going to happen. When, this is me personally. I got a list of 22 prophetic words on a Google Doc about all this stuff that's about to happen. And I'm thinking, when in the blibbity blibbity bleep sometimes is that going to happen? I know y'all don't ever think that. It's just me up here in my purple sweater. But sometimes I be thinking, God, how are you going to do what you said you was going to do? And then there's a voice of faith in my heart that says, you know what? I 
know everything. And God starts to tell me, you, you don't have to know when I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it, where I'm going to do it. All you got to know is that I know. There is a worship that you can find in your soul that is not predicated on the obvious, but it's predicated on the fact that I know someone who knows the stuff that I don't know. And when I start to think about the fact, God, you, you, I may not see it, but because you stand outside of time and because you were at the beginning, because you are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, I start to find a trust that even when it's not obvious to me, there's a better reason to worship and it's on the foundation that God, you, 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 you're omniscient, you just know. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's okay, I do. God, I don't know where the kids are right now and I've been praying for them and they went off to college and I don't know what they're doing. And I'm gonna... I do. Before they were yours, they were mine. I know. God, I just don't know how these bills are going to work out. And I do. I, I do. And when I start to hear him reassure me, oh, God, I don't know how this marriage is going to work. I do. I can find myself in a place where I'm worshiping because it's obvious to me and because I trust that he knows. Seven good reasons to worship. Seven better reasons to worship. Um, you can worship God. This is one of my favorites, and I switched this up. So if I told you before, some of y'all thought well, you know what I was going to say. I changed it last minute. <laughs> Let's hope it works, though. Um, you can worship God because God is relaxed. You've never thought about it like this. I was reading a commentary, and someone said, Meeting Jesus would have been meeting the most relaxed person you've ever met in your life. If you know what's going to happen, if you're walking in steps that are ordered, that your dad ordered, where are you hurrying to? Jesus, there's, there's so many people and we got to get the fish. And I don't, you guys feed them. Oh, Jesus, but did you like... No, y'all just, just, um, you know, just sit them down. Sit them down in groups. A groups of what? Just sit them down. It's going to be fine. Jesus walked slow, too. He, he didn't know where for him to go. He's like, I'm going to die in one year, 242 days, six minutes, and 32 seconds. I'm just. And some of you. You feel like Jesus is anxious. He's like, he's playing defense and he's got, he's Duke. Where are Okay, where are they? Don't, 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 don't sleep with them. Don't, don't smoke that. Don't, ah, ha, ha, ha. My quads hurt. Boy, I could fall over right now. <sighs> Let me go back to my chair. Ooh. Let me drink some of this water. I'm not joking. Okay. Where's the electrolyte capsules? Micaiah, get the capsules. Um, <laughs> but your Jesus is so frantic. He's so frantic when you make a mistake. As if he didn't know you were going to do it. You think he's like, oh my gosh, they ruined my plan. He, he stands outside of time. And if you approach him as the young man who was returning to his father's house after spending all of the inheritance that his dad gave him, and he walks up and he has a speech prepared because you think he's going to respond how your mom responded. You think he's going to respond how your dad responded. So you come to him with your head down. And you're just thinking, just don't. He's going to freak out. He might hit you. He might. He might. Some of you, the damaging response you got as a child was actually no reaction. 
And the reason you did all that stuff is because you just wanted someone to respond. And the fact that they let you do whatever you wanted was more damaging because you were acting out and doing stuff you didn't even want to do, but you just wanted somebody to care. You come to Jesus, Jesus, I messed up again. Hey, it's okay. Paul, man, would you take this thorn, please? Three times I asked him. And every time, you know, Paul, my grace is, is sufficient. It's enough. And if you find yourself today in a place where you feel like, I just don't know what to do, and I've got a lot of baggage, and I told, you can come to Jesus, and you can worship him with that, because God is relaxed. A good reason to worship is because God is relaxed. A better reason to worship is because God is righteous. He is perfectly right within himself, and everything he does is always right. So when I start looking at stuff that doesn't seem like it went my way, when I start looking at my life and the mistakes I've made and the things I've done, and I, God, I don't know if you're good. I can trust that, Lord, yes, you are relaxed, and I can trust also you're not just relaxed. Your relaxedness is in the fact that you are still right. And even though I've made mistakes, even the scripture says it this way, he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become and we might become the righteousness of Christ. A good reason to worship is trusting that you know, my God is relaxed. He's OK. He's got. And I, but I want to invite you into a place to understand he is relaxed and he is righteous. And please do not confuse his relaxedness with the fact that his righteousness still demands a standard. This is something that people don't know how, this is why the church hasn't taught you to hold both of these things. He can be relaxed and still be like, yeah, I'm, I don't fool with that though. I, that's, I told that is not what we're gonna do. I, I love you, I have grace for you. And this is not the best for your life. And because some of us, we have gotten so in a desire to connect to the human part of Jesus and the, and, the, and the relatable part of Jesus, you have forgotten that he is still the one in the Old Testament. When God said, carry the ark this way and don't carry any other way. And the people said, let's just put it in a barrel. So they put the ark in a barrel and then it starts to fall over. And the brother's like, let me help you, Jesus. And he touched it and boom, brother job dead. Oh, that's such a harsh God. No, 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 no. Actually, his instructions... Where it always needs to be carried this way. This is an Old Testament story. I done jumped back way back. Carry it this way. Don't carry it any other way. Okay. But this one time, I'm going to put it in the barrel. Just, you know, because I be getting tired when it be resting on my shoulder. So we're going to put it in the barrel. Don't carry it this way. Don't ever touch it. It cannot be touched by human hands. Why? Because my holiness, my glory, the fact that I am somebody that created everything you're looking at, we can, there's just, a, here's the beautiful thing. There is a trust you can have to hold both realities. He is righteous and there is a standard and they is, there is a reality. And right here, well, let me do it this way because this is just beautiful. Righteousness and relaxed in the Old Testament, there would have been a veil right here. <laughs> this is all Bible. I'm preaching up here. There would have been a veil right here, but it was torn from the top. And because you can understand, God, you're relaxed and I can be in your presence, even though I don't have it all together. But I walk into your presence and your Holy Spirit will convict me and say, hey, that's not the best I have for you. I love you where you are, but I also will empower you to do the thing I've called you to do. Baby, you can trust that you can come to me with all your pain. You can come to me with your wrong decisions. But know when we walk out of this time together, you're going to know who you are so you won't go back to those things you're doing good to know that your God is relaxed and not surprised but better would be to know he is also righteous a good reason to worship God is because God is simple 
Now, that has nuance to it because to say that the person who created the molecules that you aren't even conscious of right now feels like, uh, how is he simple? John 3.16. I can sum up the whole thing for you real quick. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting. The gospel, simple. Even in the Old Testament, there were a lot of rules, but it wasn't like God was just up there like, just guess what I want you to do. Try that and see what happened. Well, he said, let me give you a list of these 10 things that I would just avoid. Don't kill people. Don't lie. Like, it wasn't this. And sometimes we get so caught up in like, ooh, what's the next? The, the simple things. God, I can worship you for the simple stuff. The fact that, that I am here and you woke me up this morning and God, you've done some good stuff in my life. Jesus, I am grateful. Some of y'all have missed, you have missed so much because you have forgotten how to be grateful. Some of y'all, the only time you feel so good is around Thanksgiving because it's just natural. Well, go around the table, say what you're grateful for. You go around and then you kind of leave like, man, everything's kind of good. Because there's something about the muscle of gratitude when you start thinking about the, like the simple stuff. I started during, um, during our last paternity leave with our baby, I started doing this thing because having kids will mess up your devotion time with Jesus. It'll just like, I'm going to wake up at this time and spend an hour and a half with God. And the kid's like, the heck you are? Like, huh? I'm up at 4.30 ready to watch Octonauts. What are you doing? It's like, well, I don't know what I'm about to do. So... This is um, the foundation of my time with God that then this is what I absolutely do every single day. And then if I'm reading more or extra stuff, but this is like non-negotiable. Every single day, I have this little notebook. It's in my backpack right now. I write down one thing I'm grateful for, one scripture, usually a Psalms or a proverb, and one like three to four word prayer every single day. Write down, I'm grateful for a wife who creates space for me to be dramatic in my commitments. <laughs> I am. Because like, if I would have ended up with some other girl, she'd be like, listen, dummy, you is not in the Tour de France. You is not about to ride this bike. And my wife was like, you know what? Go for it, baby. <laughs> I am very grateful for that. Write down one scripture and one prayer. My provider, I'm grateful. And throughout the day, I just go back and I just be looking at it. Oh man, I am grateful. I'd be something happened and I'd be frustrated at Abby, and then I crap open crap crap open, crack open my little book. Oh wait, I am grateful for a wife who creates space for me. To, and there's something about being grateful for the simple stuff. I am so grateful that my little boy has that brown curly hair. When I see it, it just fills my, I'm so grateful for Arlo's curls. I'm so grateful for Luna's spunk. I'm so grateful for Jade, the fact that she ain't got a tooth over here. She just got one big tooth, she missing a tooth and it's weird. We need to take her to the dentist. But right now, I'm really <laughs> grateful. I said she got the two front, she got one over here, then the fang, she on this side is just a big fang. I'm like, whoa, baby, you done got that snaggle tooth. But I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to roast my daughter. She doesn't understand what I'm saying right now. If, sweetie, if you ever see this message, daddy loves you. Um, <laughs> you had a snaggle tooth from about 18 months to whenever we get it fixed. But there's something about gratitude for the simple stuff, for the stuff that you just pass over because of this. It's not great. But there's a lot of good in your life that you could be grateful for. A good reason to worship God is because a lot of the time it's simple. And a better reason, he's sovereign. So if you're over here on simple, and I need to know Jesus loves me, that's what, I'm, that's what I need to know today. I ain't got time for how the nuance of his sovereignness and our free will and I don't, how does that, no, 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 no. Simple, for God so loved me that he gets, I'm right here on the fact that this is simple and I can worship him on that fact. And there is a space to trust 
that God, even because here's the thing, many of us, again, this is holding both. Your theology is so simple that it can't make sense of the book of Job. Book of Job. Let me set the scene for you. God's up in heaven. The royal court. This is language in the Bible. This ain't no uh, lion witch in a wardrobe. This is in the Bible. The royal court comes before God. And the scripture says, and Satan joined them. And I thought, well, he just be rolling up to heaven like that? Like, hey guys, what y'all doing? It's like that, that old dude that used to be in high school, but he not anymore. And he pull up in a raggedy Corvette and he'd be like, hey y'all, how y'all doing, man? I used to go here. It's like, what? Who are you? That's the first chapter of Job. Satan rolls up as the dusty old high schooler with no good memories, all except in 1978. And he rolls up into heaven. And he's like, you know, I've just been looking out, seeing what's going on. And God has the nerve to suggest somebody that he should go mess with. Now, where are your theology at on that? Where are your simple, well, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. If it's a good thing, it's God. If it's a bad thing, it's the devil. Yes. And Job chapter one. <laughs> so what are we going to do about that? We're just going to act like that book doesn't exist? Or we stand in a place to say yes. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says to him, well, of course he worships you. He's got a lot of money. If I took his money away, he wouldn't worship you. God says, go ahead. But you cannot harm his physical body. That'll, that'll break down your TikTok theology real quick. <laughs> you saw some guy on YouTube talking about, this is how I break it down. You're 19 years old. You don't... I haven't done anything, but like, you start getting, there's some stuff in this book that I have to trust. God, there's a party, David says this way, I have not lifted my head too high, and I am not concerned with stuff that is far too grand for me to understand. God, there's a box of stuff that I just got to trust. You are sovereign. You are good. You, Lord, I trust your character. I trust who you are. It don't make sense to me. I can't explain it. Because if you could explain it, that means you would understand it. And if you could understand it, that means it originated in your mind. And if it originated in your mind, that means it's based in human thought. And if it's based in human thought, it did not come from the throne room of heaven. So the fact that there's stuff in this book that I can't understand makes me think, thank you, God. Because if I could explain it, that means he would be like me. And the fact that he's nothing like me brings me comfort. There are parts of the book of the Bible that we have avoided. Revelations. A whole book of the Bible that I said that and y'all went, ooh, ooh, okay, <laughs> Revelations. <laughs> you want me to explain Revelations to you? It says it in the first situation, first four words. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The last red letters in your Bible ain't in the Gospels. So wouldn't it make sense that the enemy would want you terrified to even crack open the part of the book where the king of kings is still talking? But it's just this, this, this. Here's the thing. Revelations ain't simple because angels are not little chubby babies with wings shooting arrows. They got multiple heads, multiple eyes. There's a wheel within a wheel. What does that mean? God is sovereign. I don't know, but I trust him and he's good. Well, how do you explain the, you know, this incongruency with the fact that the, I don't know. God is sovereign and I trust him and he's good. Well, how would you explain that, you know, bad people are good things and there are people who are still hungry. I don't know, but God is sovereign and I trust him and he's good. And as long as we look to people to explain a book written by the ultimate creator, you will always be disappointed. I found some holes in the book. You're a human, dummy. 
Well, according to my calculations, where did you get those calculations from? Because even the fact that you got those things to calculate came from the creator you trying not to explain. Get out of here. God done gave you the mind you got, and you got the unction to be like, well, let me tell you how. That is crazy. Well, I, you know, I, well, you, did you wake yourself up this morning? With all those calculations, you telling your heartbeat to go, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> bro, get out of here. <laughs> get out of, go home and sit down. Calculate in your basement. <laughs> That's crazy. A good reason to worship God is because He's human. For we do not, oh, let, me, let me read you this actually, because I want to make sure that we're finding all this stuff on the Bible. We ain't out here just making stuff up. <clears throat> Y'all hear that? Pages turning. <laughs> what is he doing up there? In the beginning, the word already existed, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he existed in the beginning with God. He created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. I'm jumping down to verse 14. So the word became human and made his home among us, for he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. A good reason to worship is the fact that Hebrews says we don't have a high priest who can't relate to us. One of the worst things is to meet somebody and feel like, are you a human? You ever met those people that's just like, so I woke up at 4.30 this morning, you know, I saw, now listen, I can't say it because God may ask me to minister to the man one day, but there was this man talking about how he made four days out of one day. Have y'all seen that clip? He's like, I wake up at one and then it's another day. I was just, it maybe just got me. I could be me. I didn't understand it, but there's a comforting fact to the reality that there's a human, he's, he's fully God and fully man. Now, the nuance of that can mess with you, but I, there, he's fully God and, not but, and fully God and fully man. And there's something that draws my worship when I think about the fact that you get me. You know that? Anybody ever said that to you? God gets you. I grew up feeling like nobody really understood. When I get, like, that's just how I go. Nobody really understands why I do. And I still feel that a lot of times. People be saying stuff like, well, you just don't understand, man. Like, I feel, you want to know who understands you? Your, your savior, the high priest says we don't have a savior that can't relate to us. For he was tempted in every way. Now, that every way has had me shook some days. I ain't done a study on that one, but that be tripping me every way? Because I've had some crazy thoughts up here. I, you, you was tempted exactly like I was. For real? With them? He says, we don't have a high priest that can't relate to us, for he was tempted in every way. So he's human. But there's a comma after that. Where I find a, there's, a, there's a good reason to worship. If you need the fact to understand that, man, God, he understands. He understands my brokenness. He understands betrayal because he had somebody. He understands feeling like, man, nobody really gets, because a prophet is not received in his own city. He understands, like, he gets it. He gets trying to invest in people, and they still betray. He gets in trying to be like, you know, just get behind me, Satan. Like, gosh, he gets it. For you do not have a high priest that cannot relate. For he was tempted in every way, comma, 
and yet without sin. A good reason to worship God, he's human. And a better reason, he's holy. He is completely other than. He's not, he can relate to you, but he's not a replica of you. And what we do sometimes is we project our human thoughts onto God. We do this in preaching in our, in our daily life all the time. We'd be like, I bet you God was up there like, they are so dumb. <laughs> Man, you're just a dummy. God, I don't know if, I don't, that's how you think about your children. I would never, if I was God, I would, well, thank God you are not. But we project how we think God is thinking about us, about bad people. God could never save them. Did you see what they did? Oh, that's how you think. But the scripture says, my thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts. You want to know how much higher they are than yours? As far as the heavens are above the earth. I could go real nerdy right now and start talking about light years and distances of galaxies. God says, it's so not comparable how I think to you that the only reference I could give you is one that I made up for you. And it is the space between where you are and all the planets you have never discovered. That's how much I think like you. Okay. So I probably didn't have that one right. No, you didn't. But, no, 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 comma, and you're doing good. So I, I find my worship. He's human. I do not have a high priest that cannot relate to me, for he was tempted just like me. But if I only find my worship on this part, I miss the beauty and the hope and the exhilaration of trusting that God, you're holy. When I get, when I realize, this stuff we don't talk about anymore, the fear of God. It was a concept before it was a clothing line. The, the fear of God. God, you are so, and here's what happens. People who are super connected to the fear of God, you think that the fear of God and the grace of God are in competition. Because you have people in church who are either grace people or fear people. And the problem is, is you're a human, so you think you have to pick. God's, if you give them too much grace, they're they need to know the fear of God. Well, you fear. This, here's the thing. When you understand how holy he is, when you understand that he could go like this and you just drop that, like, when you understand people was walking into his presence, and they had to tie a bell around these priests back in the day. And they was jingle bells up into the Holy of Holies. And if they had any sin that was not confessed and a sacrifice, they would drop dead. And jokers would be outside listening. Jingle, 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 When I realize that's who showed up in the middle of worship today. <laughs> when I realize he walked down this middle aisle and inhabited our praises and I'm still got breath in my, God, you're worthy. God, you're holy. God, thank you for. <laughs> oh. A good reason to worship God, I gotta speed this up. A good reason to worship God is because He's immediate. He is immediate. There's a woman in a crowd, she's pressing through, she spent all her money on, on stuff, and she couldn't get better. And she's been bleeding for 12 years. And she walks up, squeezes her way in between uh, this crowd, and she touches the hem of his garment. And the scripture says, and immediately. 
Not after warfare, not after she did all the right, not after she confessed all the lies she had made, not, and immediately she was healed. God, there are some things, is there anybody in love where God showed up, it felt like God, you showed up right, like I prayed and you, for I prayed and he heard my prayers. There's been some stuff, there's been some, I'm just reminding you, there's been some prayers you pray and you woke up the next day like, oh my gosh, I have more grace. I did not, I was confused and depressed and I woke up this morning feeling like there are some of you that you've had hurt and pain in your body. Somebody walked up and said, I just want to pray for you in the name of Jesus, receive healing. And you said, hold up, that, I used to, let me switch, like, that, I'm telling this story. So there was, um, I, when I used to race BMX as a kid, I was watching a, a, a televangelist and I was watching the TV and I broke my shoulder blade. There was a crack. My mom has the x-ray, a crack down my shoulder blade from where I had flipped and cracked it. And I'm watching this guy on TV and he's like, there's somebody watching right now. And you're in a sling and you have a crack right down your shoulder. God says you're healed. And I'm sitting there at eight years old. I'm sitting on the end of my mom and dad's bed. My mom and dad are talking. And I turn around and go, mom, that's me. And I yank my shoulder up out this sling. And I'm like, that's me. That's me, mom. I promise. Like, and my baby's like, stop it. What are you doing? Stop, 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 stop. We go to the doctor. My mom has the two x-rays to this day. Two days later after I got the x-ray and there was a crack. Crack is gone. Don't tell me my God ain't immediate and can work a miracle. God can show up right. I want to encourage somebody. You've been praying. You've been thinking, I don't know how it's going to. God can meet you right where you, immediately he can dry up cancer. Immediately he can restore a relationship. God. And I can worship on the fact that God, no matter what happens, I know you can show up right now. It may look down to the wire. It may not. They may be saying, yeah, just like they said to Shay and Osby. Yeah, you just might want to prepare for a funeral. You might want to prepare for a funeral, but I don't move like that because I believe that in a moment. And if you're in here today and your worship came in looking for something immediate, I want you to know you're in the right place. If you showed up today looking for like, oh, I just need, I need something to change when I leave today. Let me tell you, I know somebody. He's done it for me. He's done it for my friends. He's done it for my family. I know somebody that in the middle of a situation, immediately, he can show up. A good reason to worship God, he's immediate. And a better reason He's infinite. God is always on time. But, and I'm using this but clearly, he's not in time. He's always on time. Please do not get it twisted. He's not in time. He created time as a construct for you not to be late to work. But he don't live within your timetable. So when you start to feel discouraged because you're not doing it when you said you were going to do it, well, actually, like a thousand years for you is kind of like one day for me. So I can't really like, I'm always on time, but I'm not, I'm not in time. So there's a place that I can trust. God, there are some things you've done that have been immediate. And I worship you for them. And there's some areas that I have to find hope in the fact that you are infinite. So if the word you gave to me about the beacon of light the Metcalf name, or the Johnson name, or the whatever name, if the word that you spoke doesn't come to pass with me, I can still trust the fact that my great, 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 great grandchildren, I can trust in the fact that you're infinite. Good reason 
immediate. He can meet you right where you are. A better reason, he's infinite. And even when it's not immediate, I know, God, you, you stand outside of time. And I have to trust that. Good reason to worship, he's working. And a better reason, he's worthy. A good reason, he's obvious. A better reason, he's omniscient. A good reason to worship, he's relative. And a better reason is he's righteous. A good reason to worship is he's simple. And a better reason, he's sovereign. A good reason to worship, he's human. And a better reason, he's holy. A good reason to worship, he's immediate. A better reason, he's infinite. Last one, a good reason to worship is because God is the priority. There's some of you who there has been so much fruit in your life from deciding and saying, God has to be the priority. He's the focus. He's getting my attention. He's getting my investment. He's getting all, like, he is the priority. And there's a special and unique type of worship that happens when you understand, when you, when you silence out everything else, when the opinions of other people, when the plans that you made, when you decide, God, you are the priority. You are the only thing that matters. You are the one that I worship. Yeah, I am here for you. A good reason is he's priority. And a better reason, he's preeminent. Preeminent means whether or not you recognize his firstness, he has always and will always be first. I understand this sentiment, but we say things in church like, you should put God first in your life. I completely get that. And to be clear, we do not put God anywhere. <laughs> he is preeminent. He is first, whether or not you recognize it. He is first. He's above all. He is, he. So it's good to make him a priority. I think 100% you should do that. That is good. And it's better to realize before I even acknowledge him as a priority, he is first. He's above every situation in my life. He's above all the sickness in my life. He is, a, he is first. The Bible says it this way. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things are held together. Priority is good, 100%. If you're in a place where you've had other things as a priority in your life and you're saying, God, I'm focusing on you. You're doing good. And I want to invite you to be able to recognize, God, you have always been here. You will never leave me here. And long after I am gone, you, the government could change. A famine could strike, and you, the dollar may be moved, but you are, far, you have net, there is nothing, no matter what name, no matter what, there's stuff happening in the world, we got people, it's like, well, you see, so-and-so did a partnership with a demonic thing, and what do we think about the blah, 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 that stuff is very real, and I am more concerned with. I don't give my attention to stuff that the we be talking about what the devil done. You done forgot he's done defeated. My focus choose to be on the fact no matter what collaborations y'all do, my God is 
first. You can worship whoever you want to worship. You can talk whoever you want to talk to. But my God is preeminent. He is above all and he will not be moved. There's a security I find in trusting his position. And the nuance, and I'm closing with this, the team can come up. The nuance of finding and examining your foundation. The whole premise of where I wanted to encourage you and invite you to today is very honestly, there have been times in my life where the why I was standing on was weak. I got a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old, and a zero-year-old right now. I got all the numbers. Pray for me. And we're just getting into the why question. Well, why do we, and why, and why? And you know, we're trying to be intentional parents, and Gentle parents, if you've heard of this, some of y'all OGs, you like gentle what? <laughs> like gentle, no, it's just. <laughs> but a part of tr us trying to be intentional with our kids is kneeling down. Okay, baby, what do you, just tell me what you're saying. I'm, I'm here, I'm right here with you. But there reaches a point. <laughs> this, and let me tell you this, let me be honest. My point is a lot shorter than Abby's point. Abby can be over here answering questions. I'm usually somewhere over here. And there's these infamous words that as a parent you say you'll never say until you're a parent when the question why is asked. And it is because I said so. <laughs> why, why do I need to put my shoes on? It could be, we're gonna stay inside the rest of the day. But if I said put your shoes on, because I said so. Because I said so is easy motivation, yet empty of revelation. So I can get you to do something, but you don't know why you're doing it. The only problem is, as you mature, me telling you, if you're so connected to what I told you to do, and not the why behind what I told you to do, you won't have tools that you can use as a grown person. Don't touch the stove. Why? Because I said so. Okay. Then they ain't cooked. And they 35 and single because mama said, don't touch the stove because she says so. No, there was a why because at this current stage in your development, you can't understand that this is hot and it'll burn you. But there'll actually be a point where, you know, you can actually use this in a veto. We've done this with sex in Christianity. Don't have sex. Why? Because God says so. And that's all you. And yes. He is holy, he is sovereign, and he's the only person that gets to say, because I said so. But as a parent, when you start to tell your kid, don't have sex, why? Because I said so. Here's what happens. You either get removed from the conversation. Well, mom said not, well, because it's just not good. Well, mama, maybe you ain't doing it right, because I heard Jimmy told me that... <laughs> Did mama say? <laughs> I don't know if that's the greatest motivator. Easy motivation. No revelation. Don't have sex. Why? Because it is the most beautiful, powerful, pleasurable thing on the face of the planet that the God that we worship created. And just like fire, it can be used to build and warm, yet not put in its proper context, it will destroy everything you have. 
So that is why in this time of your life, it would not be best for you to engage with something. Many of us, your why you worship, some of it is really good. But there are areas I want to invite you into better. I want to be able to stand on something that I can trust. Yeah, God, you're simple. And I understand that I don't understand everything. And so I trust the fact that you're sovereign. Today, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. The band's going to play. And I want to give you an opportunity to do one of two things. To find rest in where you are and the opportunity to step into something new. The first individual is the person who has felt so overwhelmed with not being good enough. You need the opportunity to sit in worship and to not hear me say you're doing good. So I could say that a lot, but there's someone who could tell you that it would hit a little different. And there are others of you that you're doing good and you're a couple miles into the ride and you're feeling like, I think I got a little more in me. I think there's a little more faith than I thought I would. Maybe that hardship did produce a steadfastness on the inside of me. Maybe I do really trust this God of the universe. Maybe he is going to work on my behalf. And there's some of you that I want to graciously invite from good into better. When Jesus says in John 10, 10, I came to give you life and life to the full. The word life, Zoe, they would have heard that word and thought, oh, we know what that is. Life. Jesus, he repeats himself to draw emphasis to the fact that the life you just thought of, that's not what I'm talking about. The word, this word, I was about to say it, but it starts with a P and I kind of lost it. It starts with a P in the Greek. It is an overwhelmingly abundant and obnoxious amount. He says, I came to give you life and just to be clear, and a life that is so full, that overflows so much with joy, that overflows so much with peace, that overflows so much with faithfulness, that oh, I came to give you not just the life you thought of, I came to give you a life overflowing. Today, no matter which side you stand on, if you're in good, when you hear God say you're doing good, you'll start experiencing, man, this isn't just life. This is, my life is full. When you start to look at the simple things God has done, God, you, my life is full. But you ain't got no more. No, 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 no. My, my financial situation didn't change. I just realized that God has kept me. So I, I am full. There's a space to where I can fix my focus on the fact that, God, you are, you're so good. God, you're worthy. God, you're omniscient. God, you're righteous. God, you're sovereign. God, you're holy. God, you're infinite. God, you When I line that out, that's why I worship him. That's what I find myself in. That's why I acknowledge him. That's why I worship him. That's why I give my life to him. That's why no matter what people say, I'm not moved. That's why as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is who. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. We're going to sing this song. It says, Yahweh. Rain over, take over. I love it because it's simple. There are some songs that got a lot of words 
And I just came, I, sometimes I don't have a lot of words. There's some revelation in the song. Rain over is good. Rain over. Just do what you're going to do. Take over is better. Why? Because rain over is acknowledging, God, you're just going to do whatever you're going to do, no matter how you're going to do it. Take over is I'm giving it to you. So I want you to reign over, take over. But all of this, I'm not just talking to my friend. I'm not just talking to a good person. I, I want to be clear. Reign over, take over, Yahweh. You, it's all about you. I'm going to ask the worship team to sing. and We're going to take a moment just to ask him to do that. Before we do that, I want to do two quick prayers. Actually, one quick prayer. If you're in this room, you've never accepted Jesus. You're listening to this. You're watching this. You've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. What I laid out, either one of those paths is a beautiful invitation to why you should worship God. You've been curious. You've been on the fence. I could give you seven good reasons, seven better reasons on why he's worthy of your worship. Here's what you need to know. He loves you no matter what you've done, no matter the mistakes you made. In one moment, when you surrender your life to him, everything changes. Not your circumstance all gets better, but you have someone in you that you are so aware of his love, kindness, goodness, graciousness, and, and, and favor towards you. There's this miraculous mirror. You want to talk about a miracle that happens? Jesus comes to live and be with you no matter where you are. You want to accept this gift of Jesus? I'm going to say a prayer. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something different. Keep your eyes open. Because God can see your heart no matter if you feel relaxed, embarrassed, or worried about who sees your hand. I'm not going to make you raise your hand. Keep your eyes open. The Bible says watch and pray. Everybody repeat after me. Say, dear God, dear God thank, you thank you for loving me. For loving me. I admit I've made mistakes. Save me, change me, transform me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can we make some noise for people who just, people just made the decision to follow Jesus? If you just made that decision, that is the best decision you could ever make. Can we make some noise? We are so proud of you. Hey, listen, we would love to connect with you. If you would text the word SAVE to the number that comes up on your screen, if you're in here locally, we want to put a Bible in your hand. We want to meet you. If you go out to the lobby, our people with the orange shirts will have a gift for you. We are so proud of you. So proud of you. You are doing good. Let's take a moment right now to worship our good God. Would you sing this with me? Come on. Take over Yahweh, Yahweh, reign over, take over, your name is Yahweh, 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 reign over, we give it to you. Just lift your voice and say it again.
today. Yeah. When you're at work tomorrow, when you're with your family tonight. Thank you for the sweet reminder today that we're doing good. Right where we are, we're worshiping you where we are. And I pray that we would be sensitive to the call, that if you're calling us into better, if you're calling us into more, that we would say, have your way. Have your way is our simple prayer today, Jesus. We thank you for it. We honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you all so much. Thank you for being here with us. Go out and live a transformed life. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Here at Transformation Church, our vision is to represent God to the lost and the found for transformation in Christ. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text GIVE to 828282 or you can visit on our website. Also, be sure to subscribe and check out all the other incredible sermons available, as well as watching our live Sunday experience that begins at 1045 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now, go out and live a transformed life.